Um, tonight, we, um, we, we decided that we would like to try and pull together the, the sessions that we've had looking at violence in 1921 by thinking about the post-war period as well and how the post-war Italy uh, violence uh, reflects and relates to that. How it, what, what's the connection? What's the relationship between the two? And that was principally going to be, um, in many ways, partly because it's something that John uh, John Fort has been, uh, well, he's now moving on. He's just finished his work on um, Squadrismo, which will be published next year. And I think he's moving back on to look at the 1970s. So something he was very keen to uh, to discuss and to discuss with our panel tonight. Um, unfortunately, John's had a, um, a a bit of a family uh, problem this evening and he can't be with us. Um, so we are still fortunate to have two um, expert speakers uh, with us looking at this topic tonight. First of all, we got um, Andrea uh, Mamoni, who's a historian uh, and also a media commentator. Uh, we, you may know him from his career in uh, the University of London. He's recently moved uh, to the Sapienza in Rome and will be taking up, I believe, next next year, Andrea, a, a, um, a fellowship at the Itali as an Italian fellow at Columbia University. Um, he's been a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania and the European University Institute uh, in Florence. He's published um, many works on the um, post-war contemporary European far-right parties uh, on, and on Italian uh, society and history, including transnational neo-fascism in France and Italy, which is obviously very pertinent to this, pro uh, to this uh, session today. He's currently working on a book on Southern Italy uh, and the myth of the Bourbons. Um, and he's also, you may well know him for his uh, blogs for various, um, uh, blogs and articles for various uh, news outlets, including the Huffington Post in Italy, um, and various British publications, The Guardian, The New Statesman, um, and also um, sometimes for the, for the Independent, his recent um, quite interesting, quite barbed uh, exit, Brexit from, uh, from England, which was, uh, which, was a, which, was an which was an interesting read. Um, so thanks to and Andrea for being with us. Um, we've also got Giorgia Bulli, who is a senior lecturer in political science at the uh, Cesare Alfieri School of Political science at the University of Florence. Uh, there she teaches political communication and discourse analysis. Uh, her main research areas are extreme right political parties and movements, political communications. She's done a lot of work on migration. Um, she's the author of numerous articles on these topics. And very interestingly for, for this session, which was particularly why we were, were interested in, in asking her to speak, is her work as a co-author on the history or the, the on, on yeah, the history of the Casa Pound movement in Italy, Casa Pound Italia, Contemporary Extreme Right-Wing Politics, published by Routledge in, in 2020. So that's the theme of um, this evening's discussion about this, this issue of fascist violence that continued um, throughout, the, which has continued throughout the post-war period in, 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 in Italy. Um, the session we were thinking to look at the way that uh, look at fascist violence to maybe to consider later on perhaps um, violence against fascism, but to try and think about um, why it happened, what connections there are uh, between these two movements, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So what I'd like to do at this point is I, I would like to hand over to, uh, to our speakers. Um, I'm, I'm sure you would. Um, we want to hear as much as we can from them. Um, I'd like to ask them if they could both, I'll go to Andrea first, but if they could both perhaps introduce a little bit about their work uh, on this topic. And if also we could um, think about this, this issue of pre and post-war fascism, and perhaps you could sort of draw out some of the, the, the differences that we can identify between pre and post-war, post-1945 fascism or, or squadrismo, perhaps even if we can talk about that term. Um, I wonder personally if it's it's a term that's been perhaps banded around and also quite recently, which is something we might come back to with the, the recent attack on the CGL building. I, I wonder if it's, is it correct perhaps to speak of squadrismo and fascism in the current period? Does this perhaps, does this dilute the impact of its term? Does it give it a, 
uh, does it take away from the specific meaning? So I think perhaps if, if, you, if you could talk about your, your work and then think about the differences and the connections between pre and post-war fascism, um, and that will, that will get us off and running. So thank you again for both of you for being here. Andrea. Okay. I start. Thank you very much for inviting me, first thing, of course. And uh, yes, my research is in, in some ways related to, 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 to the, of course, to the theme of today and, and uh, unfortunately in many ways to what is happening uh, in, contemporary, in the contemporary West, at least. I mean, I cannot talk about our other area of the globe, but if we look at India, for example, is another uh, interesting and terrible example in, in some ways on violence and the sort of authoritarian fascist like uh, regime coming coming back so now the question that you answer that you the, 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 the question that you just asked is quite interesting because relate with some of the work that i did especially at the beginning of my career which is partly in my in the book that you mentioned on transnational uh, neo fascism because transnational neo fascism was looking mostly at the evolution plus the interaction between the french and the italian let's say far right from 1945 to today but in terms of violence for example which i don't cover a lot in the book itself i came across um before I came across the reaction of the of the far right of the fascists uh, since uh, 1943, and is also an history of 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 revenge. Is an history made of nostalgia and is an history made of attempt violence at least. So in some ways, I would say that the seeds of what happened in Italy in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on, for example, is in many ways related to a refuse of the democratic system that happened in Italy, uh, certainly since 1945, but also probably since 1943, with the fall of Mussolini, the, the, uh, the Armistizio in September, and then the creation of the Salò Republic. Why I'm telling you this? Uh, in reality, there is a, another big um, frame here, is did fascism ended in 1945? Uh, and my, my answer is yes, and my answer is no. So yes, as a regime, Yes, as a sort of uh, set of policies of authoritarian, dictatorial, totalitarian uh, policies, no as an idea, no as a set of values, no as a, cert as a, as a, as a, as a specific um, worldview. Uh, because the people who reacted to the fall of Mussolini in, from 1943 and after 1945 were fascists were fascist people young and old, but were people involved with fascism or were people willing to fight for fascism that for some reasons were unable to reach Northern Italy and the Solo Republic or because they were too young. So what you find is like that some people after 1943 and certainly after 1945, they try to organize a sort of subversive terrorist organization in Italy. They were unsuccessful because they were able to do only some, you know, stealing the corpse of the Duce, for example, which is already a big event itself. Uh, but they were unable. The, the only difference is that after 1945, they, they had no power, no, no, no weapons. Uh, the army was not with them. And above all, the population was not with them. People, Italian people were not following the, the, the fascists after 1945. And even after 1943, many Italians were, you know, the war, the impact of war was there. Italy was, you know, invaded the allies uh, and so on, the story that we know. But these people started to build a sort of network, a strange organization. As I said, a, fail, a, a failing organization. They organized little groups, uh, clandestine groups. This is called the fascismo clandestino. 
Uh, and these people for, basically starting in the south, in Sicily and Calabria, Naples, they wanted to build a sort of, you know, revolution. I mean, these, these were dreams, I have to say. But, you know, their idea was that, you know, at some point, a sort of new coup d'etat or a new return of fascism. But uh, of course they were unsuccessful. They didn't manage to do anything real. Any, they didn't have any impact. But what is interesting here, in my view, is A, that they, they were rejecting the defeat, and B, that they were rejecting democracy. Because even some of the people who later or immediately entered into the MSI, the Italian Social Movement, which is the main, let's say, permutation of Italian fascism after 1945, the party was established in 1946, actually, not all of them were accepting democracy. Some of them were accepting democracy because it was the only way to be in politics to be into the political system, even if they were in a sort of ghetto. But some of them, I read some of the stuff, uh, especially inspired by a by, um, philosopher, a thinker like Julius Evola. Uh, Evola was an heter heterodox fascist, was one who wrote about many different things. Some of them, at least for me, they're ununderstandable, uh, esoteric, and all this stuff, but Evola, for example, was talking all the time, all the time about the ruins of the modern world. So the world that these people were living was not the world that they had to live. So they had to be a sort of wa warriors, priests, people like the samurai, people like the SS, people ready, ready to fight for an ideal at some point. So this was a sort of. Uh, um, in some ways became a sort of revolutionary thinking for some, because some people read Evola in a way that we need to fight for this ideal. And this can also be a sort of revolutionary armed fight. So some of the most radical um, fringes in Italian uh, politics, in the underground of the Italian politics, were often inspired by this sort of, you know, strange, very strange environment. So these people, of course, didn't, didn't uh, accept democracy completely. And some of these people were the people like Pino Rauti, for example, this very famous Italian neo-fascist, uh, founding Ordine Nuovo, this splitter organization, um, always in the area of the MSI and neo-fascism. But some of these people uh, add links, strange links sometimes with the secret services, uh, but also with, you know, that some of them went to train in Greece uh, when there was the Greek colonial regimes. So some of these people had in mind the, the gulp, the takeover, the coup, and, and the violence of the terrorist was in some ways linked with uh, this idea of rejection of democracy, but was also a violent. Because I mean, along with the MSI, which was the most, let's say, respectable in some ways phase of the neo-fascist movement, there were all these radical young uh, fringes, which were much more, as I said, extreme than the MSI, but even within the MSI, that was, as I said, you know, the, the, the respectable face, the parliamentary face of, of, of fascism after 1945, even within the movement, there was this idea of fight. There was an idea of violence. Because, I mean, their idea was that manganello e doppio petto. So, Kazgel and being on a suit, being, you know, respectable in parliament, parliamentarian. And what is interesting, that some of the interesting thing that I, that, I, that I found in my research is, for example, how these people were, were also the fighters on the street when they were meeting with, sometimes with the anti-fascist organization or the communist organization in post-war Italy. There, there were clashes sometimes. 
And these were the people also that tried to stop the 68 movement. And they try to stop it. There is, I mean, if, it's, if, if I have a couple of minutes and I, I will tell you this, this, this little story. Uh, fundamentally in the 68, as we all know, the, 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 the left, the, let's say the radical, the alternative left was monopolizing the, the, the faculty occupations in Italy and so on. So it was certainly a moment of rebellion against the status quo. Now, the official line of the MSI was to was to um, the guardians of the status quo. So against this rebellion, also because the the, the left was too appealing for them, and and the the the, the thinkers uh, were left wing thinkers fundamentally from the so some of the people of the you know writers from the beat generation to Marcuse to to many others. Anyway, we we all know them. So the official line of the party was you know. Let's crush 68 and the youth rebellion. But in some Italian universities, including in Rome, in the university which I recently joined, some groups of neo-fascists, they were supporting occupations. So they were supporting the, the, the 68 because they saw it as a sort of generational rebellion. So they realized that you know, even if they were left the others were left wing, but some of the things that they were they wanted to change were something affecting them as well. So you know they wanted a more equal society, and and you know we all know that Italy in the fifties and in the sixties was a, an old country, also you know traditional country, and an impact of the of, of the church which is, was stronger than today, and so on. So some of these people were involved in the occupations of the faculties including in uh, letter, law in, uh, in Rome, but also in other towns like Perugia, for example. So what did the, 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 the MSI did? Almirante and others went to one of these uh, demonstrations, bringing with them some people from a Roman boxing academy. So, so people really able to, to, to fight. And they started attacking the left-wing students. When they attacked the left-wing students, you know, and they were the neo-fascists attacking them, I mean, at the end of the day, those young neo-fascists belonging to the MSI, it, there was a, a choice. And they went with the MSI to fight. So this bizarre alliance was broken and it was broken through violence because there was a, a, an actual fight, there were clashes, as, as, as we know that were happening in the, in the 60s. I think perhaps we can come back to that, Andrew, because that was one of the things we, when we sort of discussed doing, putting this together was to talk about, perhaps we can think about the, the, the forms of violence. That would be quite interesting in, in, in a moment. If we could just bring Georgia in though. Georgia, if you could uh, respond yeah. or tell us a little bit about what you do. And yeah. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. So my name is Georgia Bulli and I uh, work on uh, extreme organization and also the use of violence of extreme party, extreme right parties and movements. Um, and I have started making research uh, on the extreme right in Germany, studying uh, and analyzing the evolution of the uh, extreme right in Germany uh, since 1945. So I'm very happy that Andrea covered uh, the, uh, the past uh, uh, decades because my research is mostly focused uh, on uh, contemporary uh, politics. So uh, I started uh, uh, my research uh, on, on Germany and I had developed it uh, on extreme right and, uh, um, and uh, uh, populist right-wing parties uh, uh, in Germany and uh, uh, in Italy. So I had the chance uh, uh, to make use of uh, different uh, uh, research methods uh, during, my, uh, during my research. And one of these methods uh, is uh, the use of uh, ethnographic research. Uh, so my very big interest is uh, in understanding uh, on the field, on field, uh, why people uh, uh, decide to engage in extreme right partisan movements, why they decide to make use of uh, violence, which can be uh, a clear uh, uh, violence, uh, which is uh, uh, made uh, of uh, like 
we, we saw the example of the uh, attack on the uh, on the seat of the CGL, but it also can be the use of latent violence. Uh, I also uh, make research on uh, communication and uh, a political language, so the issue of uh, latent violence uh, of how violence can be understood as an aesthetic element, uh, which is very important for these parties uh, and movements, uh, is very important to me. And so I also decided uh, to cover the way that these groups, uh, uh, for example, uh, extreme right groups uh, invest uh, in uh, cultural uh, elements, uh, uh, like, for example, the production of music. Uh, one of my research topics uh, is the comparison between the uh, extreme right music uh, in, uh, in Germany and in Italy, and how violence appears uh, and uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is a crucial element uh, uh, of mobilization and of recruitment in these groups. So, uh, Taking into consideration uh, the, uh, the issue that has been posed, well, the differences between pre and post fascism and concentrating on, uh, on the, the, let's say the last decade uh, and making uh, uh, and focusing on my research, I could mention a few examples uh, of my recent research. The one is that has already been mentioned and it is the case of uh, Casa Pound Italia, which is a, an extreme right social movement. It is very interesting because they define this group has defines its, itself as the fascists of the third millennium. Uh, so they define themselves as belonging to an ideology, the fascist ideology, of which they underline uh, the social part, uh, like the part uh, which has more to do with the protection of uh, uh, of weak people uh, and. Uh, uh, and we can see it uh, uh, like uh, in their uh, in their normal uh, uh, way of uh, behaving, which includes from one side the use of latent uh, and uh, uh, organized violence, but on the other way, uh, they uh, the, the, the members of Casa Pound Italia uh, are very uh, interested in um, describing themselves uh, as the ones who distribute bread to the people, uh, of course, Italian people, uh, uh, because they only understand uh, uh, the, uh, the country of belonging as the Italian one, they reject uh, uh, other kinds of, uh, of nationalities. So they are very uh, uh, attentive in, in presenting themselves as uh, very, uh, very uh, next to uh, people who are weak people. On the other side, uh, I have also made research on a social, again, a social movement uh, of the radical right in Germany, which is called Pegida. Uh, Pegida defines itself as uh, uh, patriotic against the Islamization of Western societies. And uh, it is a very interesting uh, uh, movement because uh, it uh, uh, has been created uh, in, in 2014, and it has been starting organizing marches uh, in the city of Dresden every Monday. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they at the beginning they were able to uh, mobilize uh, uh, very ma many people. Like uh, now today, it's not more than two thousand people uh, uh, every Monday, which is not uh, which is not few if we consider that the movement has been created in two thousand fourteen. Uh, but the uh, the way uh, they uh, they protest, the way they uh, mobilize people, uh, as I said, uh, is an interesting case uh, uh, between the uh, use uh, of latent uh, violence in the way they speak and the way they use language uh, and the refuse of organized violence. At the beginning of every uh, gathering, uh, they make it explicit that they don't want any violence uh, uh, to be used. But on the other side, if we take into consideration uh, how much uh, the, 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 the perpetration of uh, violent acts uh, by uh, extreme right uh, uh, movements, uh, parties, uh, uh, and individuals uh, uh, has been growing in the last decades. Uh, if we take, for example, Germany, uh, it is clear that uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, acts, uh, whether racist or uh, neo-fascist uh, uh, violence, has been growing in the last uh, uh, in the last years, and it has been growing despite the fact that Germany invests very much uh, in the prevention of uh, the radicalization of uh, uh, of uh, uh, politics. Uh, 
uh, it invests very much uh, uh, resources uh, in, uh, um, in the fight uh, against uh, extreme rights parties and movements. Uh, and from an historic point of view, it is very interesting what uh, Andrea was dis discussing earlier. In when compared to Italy, where uh, the MSI always existed since uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the end of fascism, in Germany, uh, the extreme right parties, parties were banned in the 50s. But despite this, uh, they, the small parties uh, uh, were recreated. Uh, and what is interesting uh, is to notice is that the organization of extreme right and of also of extreme right violence uh, runs under uh, the legal uh, uh, landscape. So what we are witnessing now uh, is uh, a, a double uh, level uh, of uh, what you can call it uh, neo-fascism, we can call it uh, a squadrismo, we can discuss it later how these two uh, concepts uh, and labels uh, are still uh, uh, actual, but uh, there is a double level. The one very first level is, uh, level is the one of the organized uh, uh, parties and movements, uh, but there is another level uh, which runs uh, uh, on, 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 another, uh, on another perspective uh, and which is the level uh, of uh, uh, individual uh, behavior, of uh, behavior of uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, which are not that visible, but they act like, for example, the NSU in Germany, uh, which uh, has been discovered many decades, uh, uh, well, some decades later uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a terrorist uh, a group of the extreme right. Uh, so these two le levels must be taken into account if we want to understand the differences between pre uh, and, uh, uh, and post fascism. There are many uh, elements uh, uh, that can be cited uh, uh, as uh, what makes it really different between uh, pre and post fascism. I can mention some of them and then we can continue uh, uh, the discussion uh, even with Andrea. The one level is the organization of violence. The other level uh, is uh, how much can we understand uh, of uh, the, the level of the disappointment uh, uh, with democracy? Uh, which uh, is very important. Of course, it cannot, it cannot be directly compared uh, to the disappointment with democracy uh, of uh, the pre-Second uh, World War period, uh, but uh, uh, we have to take into account this, uh, uh, the element. And uh, another element which, uh, in my opinion, should be, uh, uh, should be analyzed uh, is uh, the very notion of, of uh, fascism today and anti-fascism today, as they are represented uh, uh, in the public sphere, and of course, the role of the media. Uh, the role of the media, like they are friends and foes uh, of the extreme right, they are foes because, of course, uh, they represent uh, the extreme right partisan movements uh, and populist right wing movements and parties uh, as. Uh, enemies uh, to the democracy, but on the other side, they're friends because uh, the coverage uh, of the actions and the organization of uh, extreme rights and uh, 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 populist right-wing partisan movements uh, is uh, a coverage which uh, attracts the audience. So this uh, friends and foes uh, 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 behavior uh, is uh, another uh, element which uh, uh, must be taken into account. And the very last element which I would like to mention is uh, the normalization uh, of, uh, uh, of violent political language, the normalization of the extreme right, uh, uh, the acceptance of violence uh, in the political language uh, and in the political communication, uh, and uh, how violence, uh, uh, not only through the aid speech, uh, uh, but also through these cultural levels that I mentioned, mentioned before, like for example, music uh, begins to uh, enter as a constitutive element uh, of political communication per se. Can I right. just add something to what- no, please, uh, please do, Andrea, come in. Uh, Georgia said, I mean, um, it is very interesting when she was mentioning about you know, the banning of, of parties uh, and how they can eventually survive these this, this violent cultures, you know, underground, even in a place as Germany, where, where she was rightly saying, you know, a huge work is made and has been made, so lots of funding as well. 
And on the other end, I see, you know, how things run in Italy, where there was no banning fundamentally and no money, no funding, no will towards any kind of de-radicalization de de of this. So when, you know, you both mentioned I mean, the CGL uh, staff with uh, Forza, Nuo uh, Forza Nuova, uh, entering there, there has been, you know, shortly, if you remember this, this, this thing on the media, like, you know, we should ban them and, and so on, but I mean, it was ridiculous the way that it was put through the media, by the media and some politician, even some left-wing anti-fascist politicians, because, I mean, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from another conference <laughs> venue, uh, today. So in these two days, I heard also lots of people talking about some of the issues that we are discussing uh, today, not exactly the same, but some of the issues. For example, I mean, it, it was interesting that just now I was hearing a colleague uh, from uh, the University of Roma 3, her name is Isabella Pinto, if, not, if I'm not wrong, where she was showing uh, a sort of ethnographic, not specifically ethnographic, but you know, a research that she has been doing, witnessing this, which is the violence of Forza Nuova and other movements since the early 2000s or so, with attack uh, in, in Rome, with clashes, attacking students, putting anti-fascist posters or left-wing posters, a violence which was already there and no one did anything against them. Uh, uh, quite on the contrary, we have to say in Italy, we had uh, what Giorgio was saying, you know, this normalization or legitimization of these political forces. We, we shouldn't forget that Italy is the country that, I mean, especially from a moment onwards, so the fall of the burning wall, the changes in the center left, left, Italy is a country that, you know, especially after that, in my view, started having serious problem with the memory of fascism. So fascism, you know, we have the myth of the Italian brava gente, which for a period was always there, but at least there was a strong cultural anti-fascism in politics and society. When this cultural anti-fascism in politics and society disappeared, then, of course, I mean, these movements have been legitimized because we shouldn't forget that we had a uh, the, 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 the gover il governo dei moderati, <laughs> the, the famous uh, first Berlusconi's government, embodying the, the Northern League, but also the Alleanza Nazionale MSI, which was a movement that certainly uh, some of the people were, some of the politicians were certainly trying to change, to be more respectable, more conservative. But there, are, there were lots of people, not just in the MSI itself, but in the area surrounding the MSI, which is Forza Nuova, and then Fiamma Tricolore, then some of the people within and outside Casa Pound and other movements close to the MSI. And these people felt legitimized because in some ways fascism was banalized, was normalized, was legitimized. So the, the, their violence today is not really surprising for the people who studied them or we were witnessing this violence. Because here we are talking about, you know, extremely violent um, reaction to the left against the immigrants. We shouldn't forget that for a period in Italy, not just in Italy, but for a period in Italy where the, fam the famous Ronde, Ronde anti-clandestini. So fundamentally groups of citizens going around some Italian cities to protect against the, 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 the crime, the crime coming from immigrants. I mean, of course, we can discuss if it is violence or not, but what Giorgio was saying before, which I share, I mean, this also, this, the, the, the aesthetics, the beauty of, of the act, so the beauty of, of, of the potential violence, so being muscular in many ways, against an opponent, which can be a left-wing student, which can be a university professor, which can be uh, an immigrant, in many ways has been there. And, and as she was rightly suggesting, in Italy, this is a problem which is linked with the memory of the past and with the fact that 
there has been never banning. There has been never uh, a sort of educational work against this type of violence. So it is, in some ways, it has been accepted. It has been accepted, accepted by, by the same politician, in some cases of the center left, who have, who have, who have talked about pacificazione nazionale, who have talked about uh, uh, all this stuff, you know, the, 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 the feelings of the ragazzi di, Falò, di, di Salò, and about all these things. So in, in some ways, legitimizing a political, a political let's say, uh, arena, which was made not just by Gianfranco Fini, but which was made also by people like Fiore in some ways, and by other people who, not necessarily within Alianza Nazionale, but at a local level, you can you know, easily see the links and relationships between Casa Pound and Lega, Casa Pound, the Fratelli d'Italia, or other movements. And then, you know, these people are the one with the cut gel eventually, while the others are the others with the, the, the suits, you know, manganello e doppio petto. If I can add something to what Andrea just said, um, let's take the example of the Ronde. Uh, the Ronde were not, or, not only organized to protect uh, citizens uh, themselves from, uh, uh, from any sort of violence, but they were suggested uh, also by politicians, for example, against Roma population. And it was made not only by extreme right parties, but also by, for example, the Lega uh, or the Lega Nord, when it was called the Lega Nord. Uh, so this level uh, of uh, 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 legitimation uh, uh, of, uh, of political violence, because we cannot talk it uh, in any other way, uh, runs very fast th through the, the media, through the social media. And uh, for that reason, I tend to speak about a kind of normalization of these kind of messages, uh, of violent messages. But if we also look to the images uh, of uh, the assault uh, on, the, uh, on the trade union of the CGL by uh, Forza Nuova, what we can see, and if we compare it, I uh, really much uh, appreciated the fact that uh, Andrea mentioned before that we don't only have to look at our own continent. Let's look uh, also at other continents, but the first images that come to my mind is the, the assault on Capitol Hill. Uh, so there are two kinds of also uh, events when uh, the use of violence uh, is uh, clear, when the use of violence uh, is uh, uh, represented as, uh, uh, as uh, something that uh, uh, can be uh, made without any kind of political consequences. Of course, uh, uh, people were arrested uh, and, uh, uh, and the, a political debate has been uh, uh, created, organized uh, around the very fact that if Forza Nuova should be banned or not, but without any political consequence by now. Uh, but uh, if we look at, uh, 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 at the very scene, uh, at the very moment when the CGL seat was assaulted, what we can see on the images that uh, we have in mind is uh, the assault by, uh, uh, by uh, extreme right uh, uh, individuals belonging to Forza Nuova, but then the crowd looking at it, the crowd making photographs, the crowd not intervening against this, this fact. This is dangerous. And the media, representing this, uh, uh, this event and uh, making this event uh, uh, become something that should be discussed, that, that, that was discussed in the public sphere, but the public sphere tends to be represented nowadays in the political talk shows and not in parliament. After that, uh, after the very, uh, the very fact uh, the assault of the, uh, to, the, to the TGL uh, seat, what we saw is uh, the refusal of uh, uh, Giorgia Meloni's party uh, to take distance uh, officially uh, from, uh, uh, from that uh, uh, party. Uh, of course, they, they criticized that they could not uh, uh, it uh, any other way, uh, but they refused uh, uh, to uh, officially distance themselves uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from this kind of, uh, uh, of organization, like say, we don't share anything with them, but uh, we don't want to be forced every time to call ourselves as anti-fascist. And 
the use, the political use of a political language which makes the reversal of the argument, uh, like Giorgia Meloni mentioned the Strategia della Tensione, uh, so the use uh, of the attacks uh, or against, uh, 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 against Fratelli d'Italia of uh, still having uh, uh, linkages uh, with the extreme right uh, in order to uh, break uh, the, uh, the momentum uh, of the party. She called all this, all, all this uh, as the Strategia della Tensione, so like, like presenting themselves, uh, uh, like her party and herself uh, as the victim of a strategy orchestrated against them uh, by traditional parties uh, uh, and by traditional media. So this, all these, uh, uh, these facts taken together really create a situation where uh, violence runs uh, uh, very, uh, very fast, uh, and uh, it is normalized, it is uh, legitimized, it runs uh, on political uh, level, it runs on the media level, and it runs uh, on normal level of uh, uh, com communication, interpersonal communication, which, in my opinion, is uh, the level where we should, uh, uh, we should uh, really make very much attention. Another thing is that uh, um, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, events uh, uh, and the representation of these events uh, has uh, re created a new momentum towards uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the analysis of the very notion of fascism and anti-fascism. Anti this is a debate uh, uh, which is uh, uh, running this, uh, uh, in these last uh, uh, weeks. Uh, and this is something uh, uh, that, from an historic point of view, uh, should be taken into account because uh, what we understand and what citizens uh, now understand as uh, the uh, fascist legacy and what is anti fascism today uh, really makes a difference uh, uh, towards uh, uh, what is going to happen in the future if we think uh, of the role of political violence in uh, uh, politics today. If, if I can say another thing in, related uh, uh, with what uh, Georgia just said. I mean, we shouldn't forget that when one of the interesting things about the normalization, legitimization, banalization, and the confusion that sometimes the, let's say the parliamentary, the respectable far right is, 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 is implementing today, I mean, if we remember when happened the, 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 the terrorist attacked in Macerata and then Christ Church, uh, Salvini and Meloni, Salvini, Salvini uh, um, uh, fundamentally, and Meloni of course criticized those acts and so on, but they were always talking, which some of the media does as well, we're always talking about this lone terrorist, these mad people, of course, they are mad, many of them, in many ways, but never mentioning, never mentioning the, 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 the far right, the right wing ideology of these people. So it is something that, you know, when uh, uh, rightly, Giorgio was saying about Meloni, you know, this is the strategia della tensione and so on, Forgetting who was involved in the Strategia della Tensione. The Strategia della Tensione was not only the Brigate Rosse, and so, well, there was also many other, the, many other bombings as well, uh, perpetrated by, 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 by the far right, by terrorists, right wing terrorists, Terrorismo Nero in Italy. I mean, there is you know, many, many books on that. And also, you know, like, um, I remember there was a, a tweet from Meloni because I think that it was Il Fatto Quotidiano after the Christ Church said, you know, like the, these people in New Zealand fundamentally uh, are using the same uh, great replacement theory that Meloni saw the immigrants coming to Europe, Islam and replacing us as a white race, Christian white race. And, and she immediately tweeted, you know, saying, you know, poor people, poor you, saying that you need to use me, you are left-wing, globalist, and so on. But, I mean, if someone is putting a bomb 
and he is a communist. We have to say that he's a communist. If behind the bomb there is, you know, an idea of a takeover or something else. So why we shouldn't say that those guys were coming from the far right that were reading manifestos uh, written by Breivik or by many others who are who were involved in blogs, were involved in uh, in uh, websites uh, with people from the United States against Islam, putting this imaginary of Islam, of immigrants destroying our roots and so on, that there is an invasion. I mean, the, part, the problem is that this is a sort of legitimization because I mean, it was very easy to criticize or to say, no, we disagree with uh, Fiore, we disagree with, with uh, Forza Nuova, we are against the attack of the CGL, but then, when there was the potential discussion for banning Forza Nuova, Lega, uh, Fratelli d'Italia, and Forza Italia, the moderate Forza Italia, said no, because we criticize violence when it comes from, from all sides, which is an empty uh, um, statement, but which tells a lot. Because if you create the precedente of banning eventually uh, Forza Nuova, and then there is a serious discussion on a certain type of politics, well, then you know some right-wing values, as the one used by the Lega, as the one used by by uh, Giorgia Meloni. I mean, this is problematic. I mean, the fact that uh, both Lega and uh, and, um, uh, and, and Fratelli d'Italia are, for example, supporting Orban. Orban is, is outside the democratic system today, unless, unless we call it in another way. So there is clearly a, an autocratic attempt to destroy democracy by using the state, by using democracy. I mean, we shouldn't forget the act of anti-Semitism in, in Hungary, in Poland, the real act of anti-Semitism, not just propaganda. So do we want, for example, in Italy, this type of states? So if they support Orban, they should you know, say clearly, we are against any type of violence, any type of violence against Muslim, against the Jewish, the Jewish community, for example. So, but they, they, they leave this ambiguity. And as, as, as Georgia was rightly saying, I mean, the problem is that, you know, media are covering often them, often without any, any questioning, because, you know, once that fan page with Piazza Pulita thing, uh, to, yes, Piazza Pulita, did that sort of serious, <laughs> let's say, media investigation, well, Giorgia Maloney was unable to talk or say, you know, this is a conspiracy against me. People are not like that in my party. They, you know, just a few people. No, <laughs> these are not a few people. I mean, if you talk about Hitler and you're in a party who is, who is, who is pretending to be leading Italy in the future, that's a problem because Hitler was not just a dictator. Hitler was a violent dictator using violence because we, I mean, what we said so far is that you know fascism is also made by violence violence is a form of political action so you cannot have people sympathizing with mussolini believing that mussolini was the good dictator and even you know still nostalgic of national socialism because this is not democracy it means that the risk is that at some point you might want to use violence against your opponent. And unfortunately, media and mainstream politicians do almost nothing to, to, to prevent this or to challenge these parties. Because I mean, the discussion cannot start and dance with the banning of, of, of Forza Nuova. That is really an empty discussion, useless, because we could say why we have not banned the Italian social movement in 1946, 1947, 48, and so on. They were fascists in the same way as, uh, as probably is, is Forza Nuova. So now it's too late in some ways to, to, to do the banning. Unless we really want to start a new season in Italian politics, which I hardly believe that it will start soon. 
I wonder if we if we can perhaps pick up on that sort of butt in Georgia because I mean I'm interested in what you were saying about the public sphere that there's lots of things which are coming up in this discussion which we've talked about throughout this series and I think that one thing which is very striking for me is, is from the from the very first session all the way through is certainly the role of the media um, ab absolutely crucial and, and it's come up time and time and time again in almost every discussion we've had but I, I'm interested in in th these ideas of um, okay, if if we don't ban Fortsonova, if we and that makes complete sense to me in many ways. What 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 do we do then? In in the sense that can we? Is it possible to engage with the extreme right? Should we engage with the extreme right? Do we or you know do we do we just ignore it? it it's something I've tried to do with students. I I, I take students. We go to Pradapia. Um, I've taken them to the Casa de la memoria, the Casa de Ricordia, and, and, we, and we talk to people who are openly um, supporters of, or, or they're openly nostalgic, let's put it that way, they are openly supporters of, of historic fascism. And, and it's, very, it's very uncomfortable. It's, it's quite difficult to do because apart from the fact that I have to try and translate it and, and, and so and I try to do that through kind of not filtering it. I want to put over exactly what their side of the story is. But is there a you know? And I think it's a it's a it's a useful thing to do. But then sometimes I wonder, well, are we actually you know giving oxygen to the to these sort of movements? It was a a, big, a debate in Britain some years back in in bringing the sort of Brit the idea of bringing the British National Party sort of into the public sphere, bringing people like Nick Griffin into onto. Uh, question time or British chat show, um, so, sorry, political talk show. And, and it took a huge amount of criticism and I'm not sure it was a particularly successful move, but if we don't engage and we don't ban them, what, what, what do we do? Can, you know, can, we, can we engage with these groups of people in any constructive way? Um, if I can add another, another element of reflection, uh, and taking in, into consideration the banning, uh, let's take the example of Facebook, uh, of fa the policy of Facebook. Uh, Facebook banned the, uh, 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 the pages of, uh, uh, of Forza Nuova and of Casa Pound. Uh, and how the two organizations reacted is very interesting. Uh, Forza Nuova didn't react so uh, immediately, but Casa Pound reacted immediately uh, and uh, uh, they uh, made uh, uh, made a, a, a counter. Uh, they, they asked for a counter decision by the Tribunale di Roma, and the Tribunale di Roma gave right to them, and the page was reopened. Uh, and uh, of course, Casa Pound celebrated it uh, like a very big victory. Now the question is. Uh, uh, how do we deal uh, with organizations which uh, uh, act very strategically, uh, and uh, sometimes they are uh, uh, they are successful in this strategy? And can we uh, hope uh, uh, that what politics uh, is not successful to do, like uh, uh, deciding on banning the party, uh, some kind of private corporations uh, like uh, uh, Facebook can do? Uh, so this is a, a, an interesting question, not only because of the fact that uh, we have to look at how private corpor corporations influence the, uh, the public sphere uh, of uh, discussion. And on the other side, uh, uh, look at uh, uh, how these uh, uh, this parties, movements, leaders, uh, political leaders uh, behave uh, on the public sphere. Nowadays, the public sphere is not only made of uh, traditional media, but also of digital media. Uh, there is another thing uh, that came to my mind while uh, you, Simon, and uh, Andre were discussing, and it is uh, at the uh, not not only the national level but the uh, 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 supranational level, the transnational level. Uh, if we look at, for example, uh, uh, Andre was mentioning uh, uh, Hungary, but I would like to to draw some attention to the fact that uh, we have been discussing also in the public sphere if. The European Union should finance the construction of walls to protect uh, 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 Europe uh, from uh, uh, from the coming of uh, migrants and refugees. And we always uh, see scenes of organized violence against migrants and refugees at the borders of uh, uh, of, uh, of Bosnia. Uh, so. 
What are we discussing about uh, is the fact that uh, there is uh, also a level of, uh, I would call it institutional violence, and the fact that uh, uh, also European institutions, institutions do not act, in my opinion, properly uh, to create uh, a kind of, uh, uh, of limit of what can be done and what cannot be done, of what, what we can talk about and what we should not talk about. I mean, there should be no discussion about the fact that uh, uh, European funding on the construction of, of walls should be considered as legitimate, but we talk about it. There are political positions on it. There is also always a political debate of uh, the, the, the construction of uh, uh, European uh, uh, groups of parties at the, at the parliament level. Should uh, the party of, Al of Alban be represented or not? Is it still democratic or not? And so on and so forth. So Violence also happens at, in my opinion, at the institutional level, and this is something which, of course, uh, uh, affects uh, the public sphere and also affects citizens. As a as a product, uh, as a byproduct of that, I have been making research uh, not only on extreme right parties and movements, but also uh, with pupils in the schools. Uh, for example, have made a research uh, in my region, which is the Tuscan region, and I have interviewed uh, uh, nearly 1,000 uh, students uh, aged 18, 19 with a, a semi-structured questionnaire. Uh, the, the, the research was on uh, uh, discrimination uh, uh, and uh, uh, the inclusion of uh, uh, minority groups uh, in the everyday life uh, of, uh, uh, of the students. And the very last question was, uh, do you think that discrimination is uh, that the options were never acceptable, acceptable, acceptable under under some circumstances, uh, always acceptable? And what I imagined uh, I should have received uh, as an answer uh, with the students aged 18 was it is never acceptable. I mean, the Tuscany region is. Uh, called uh, like a red region, uh, like well, region where the, the culture, is, culture of the social democratic uh, uh, culture is very important. But I received uh, 1,000 questionnaires, uh, two thirds of the, of the students uh, replied, uh, uh, sometimes it can be acceptable. So this let me think that uh, something is not going in the right direction uh, when thinking about uh, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, the, the legitimation of uh, discrimination and if we can continue in this kind of reasoning of violence. If I could just butt in before you come in, Andrew, just to say again to anybody out there who's got any questions, do use the, um, the Q&A button at the bottom of the panel there and do feel free to ask any, uh, any, any questions you'd like to put to Georgia and Andrea. Andrea okay, uh, I mean, just to answer uh, your question, I mean, what to do? Uh, certainly, as Georgia said, there is this um, uh, institutional violence which we need to take into consideration today, which has been accepted uh, and and which is part of of the at least the con the modern European history or the modern history of Europe. Um, but I mean, what the what to do is is more problematic in my view to work today, especially because of the legitimization that we have been talking about now. I mean, we shouldn't forget, because we too easily, and media especially, too easily forget that um, contemporary far right politics is also made by Jobbik in Hungary, is also made by some of the paramilitary groups in Eastern Europe, is also made by Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn has been not considered, they have been charged, they are in prison, because they are, they are, they are a sort of, you know, not simply violent. I mean, those people had links with nationalists in former Yugoslavia, for example. So some of them were trained, were trained for violence, and they and they actually implemented this violence. Nowadays, I mean, we have seen violence happening in the U.S. Real violence. We cannot talk again, only about the lone terrorists. We need to talk about uh, maybe disorganized network of people 
that are implementing or are willing to implement violence in the US now. If, I mean, if we look at what um, Forza Nova did, well, Forza Nova compared to some of the militia attacking, attacking uh, uh, Capitol Hill, Forza Nova were kids compared to them in the sense that we had a sort of, you know, coup-like in some ways. We had people there to subvert the result of a, of a democratic election with uh, Trump and, and his son, fundamentally saying, we are with you, this is an important day. I remember that the same day of the attack, um, the Donald Trump Jr., I think that is, I can remember now the name, his son said, talking about the Republicans, senators inside the, the Congress saying, uh, don't vote in favor of the election because we know who you are. So we, will, we are after you. I mean, this is violence, this is verbal violence. This is a clear, you know, in, in many ways, anti-democratic terrorist message, which is now, which is now accepted by the majority in many ways of the Republican party because they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are scared to lose elections and they, they, they believe that Trump has a strong appeal among the population. So they are fundamentally, fundamentally legitimizing groups of far-right militia that probably some of them were not even coming from the classic idea that we have of, of far-right, extreme right, radical right. But I mean, these are the people who wanted to kidnap the governor of Michigan. I mean, in, in, uh, my point that I made immediately after all these events was, imagine if this was happening in Italy or in Argentina. All the medias across the globe were talking ab about squadristi, about the march on Rome, about the fascists on the streets, and so on. Imagine if some of the politicians like, uh, you know, Meloni, Salvini, or any other, uh, or a Berlusconi was saying, you know, we are after you, we are with you, you are patriots, and so on. Again, the majority of international media would have said, you know, this is fascism, you know, the usual Italians or the Peronists or the Coops in Latin America, and so on. So this is legitimization of violence, an idea of, of exceptionalism that your country is, 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 is better than others in terms of democracy, in terms of liberalism, in, in terms of, no, this thing can happen all, only in the places where there were dictatorships or uh, coups like in Latin America. So today is extremely hard to, 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 to do something against uh, them. Let's talk with them or not. I don't know, this is a doubt that I have as well. Because I mean, one of my best friends is, is neo-fascist, <laughs> really. We know since we were at elementary school. And, and he's a nostalgic, he's not anti-immigrant. I, I tell him many times, you are simply confused because he, he comes from a, from a neo-fascist family with a tradition of voting for the MSI and so on. So he's nostalgic of this you know, glorious fascism. But I mean, with him I can talk because he's not anti-democratic. He accepts elections. Uh, uh, he criticizes often his own political. Um, he, he has no party today, and so on. But other people are against immigrants. They are against all the enemies that they can perceive. They believe in Trump, in the Trumps today, even when they talk about fraud in elections and so on. And now it's extremely hard because there, I mean, what I mean, the example that Georgia was 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 saying, like the work in Tuscan in schools and so on, that should be done all across Italy, all across many countries. But there is no political will to do that because I mean, uh, today what is the political will in the U.S.? You have Fox News, who is a megaphone, who is a sort of you know. Uh, 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 I mean, it, it's incredible. You have a, almost an, uh, an old TV cable talking about, you know, Trump or Republicans or supporting some of these people, great replacement theories, elect, uh, fraud elections, and so on. So the legitimization is there. 
And the legitimization now is a sort of, I don't know if it is a radicalization of the mainstream or a mainstreaming of the, of the far right or fascism, or you know, the, 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 it doesn't matter the label that we give, but certainly there is a huge work to be done. And in some ways, for this reason I was telling at the beginning, in some ways we are late because there is no political will to do that because the, 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 even the center left is unable. When I was saying that you know, anti-fascism is not a, a, a tool anymore, it's because anti-fascism is in crisis. It's in crisis everywhere in Europe. You know, often when I talk about you know, people that I know, uh, about you know, anti-fascism, some of them think that anti-fascism in Italy now are the ultra left wing, you know, destroying shops sometimes, a McDonald's or a bank. While you know, 20 years ago, even many, 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 many people from the Democrazia Cristiana would have said that they were anti-fascist. Not all of them, but you know, many of them. So now there has been a, a complete change, even at a European Union level, in terms of you know, words on memory, because of the pressure of the former communist states like Poland, there is also you know, equi- uh, uh, the, you know, uh, all totalitarism were the same, all without explaining what some ideas did in a country and what some ideas did in other countries, because Italian communists were not the same as the Soviet communism. Some of them were, <laughs> we know that, but not all of them. And there is also part of, of the liberal, in some ways, left or third way left, who, are, who have been legitimizing, completely legitimizing this far right. But the risk is that then you can have violence. And then what you do with violence? Because then it's not enough to say, uh, well, well, you know, we talk only with the established parties or the same parties are saying, no, we have nothing to do with them. Okay, but then stop talking about some, some issues like immigration in a violent way. Because I mean, there is all uh, iconography, there is all symbols, there are posters when you talk about l'aggressore, which reminds some of the old posters, you know, during the Salo Republic, for example, where the aggressore was the black soldier the, from an American soldier. And you have all these things, you know, they are rapist, they are violent, which Trump did for the Mexicans, so for the all Latin American people in reality. And in Italy, it was something that I remember, you know, years ago when I was younger about Albanian, about Romanian coming to Italy. So you put a violent language in any, in any case. So you, we, we, they shouldn't be surprised that then some people really, really <laughs> use violence and that is a huge problem that we are having in our societies because, I mean, the, 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 the far right wing um, acts, terrorist acts in, in the United States are, for example, much higher than any left wing or black or Muslim act, according to the FBI, not according to the, to the, the, the Manifesto Comunista in Italy. So uh, left wing, ultra left wing publication, it is the FBI. But the focus during, during the Trump administration, as we remember, was not on them, it was on the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, you know, this violence from the left, these Bernie Sanders uh, type supporters and so on. So this is a legitimization. And in my view, it's extremely hard to, to deal with this today, unless we do some of the things that Georgia said about Germany, where in any case they have the problem or what they did for example in uh, in Toscana with you know these words in the school but you need to get some funding from the region you need to get uh, politicians willing to do that and not all of them are uh, are happy to do so because there are some some regions in Italy led by the Northern League in, in Northern Italy they, they they try to put material in schools which is promoting a bizarre idea of Italian history or about, you know, all this stuff. Um, and yeah, that, that, the, the, there was a point we were going to, I think perhaps just to, to, to conclude really, I mean, I, I kind of just repeat, if anybody does have any questions, do please ask them because we, we will, uh, otherwise we'll wind up quite soon. 
the, I think the representations of violence again are, are really, really interesting. And it's something that's come out throughout these, the, these sessions and, and the, ver the various um, representations that particularly Andrea, you, you, you've highlighted there in a comparison are quite interesting. Something I, just from a personal question, I'd like, I'd like to ask, I'll come to you, George, that you mentioned some of the work that you've done on music. Could you just tell us a little bit more, more about that? Because I'm, I'm personally quite interested in that. Yeah, um, so the, the, the work I've been doing with music uh, is uh, a comparison uh, between Germany and Italy. And I started to listen to extreme right music uh, some 15 years ago. And I started with German uh, far right music. Uh, and then I, uh, I, I, I turned to Italian far right music. Uh, and I discovered that uh, uh, extreme right far right music has been used uh, as a political tool uh, uh, since the end of the uh, of the Second World War in Italy, uh, like uh, uh, with the element that Andrea mentioned, the nostalgic uh, element, like many bands were created uh, uh, since the 50s. Uh, uh, and there have been many phases uh, where music has been used uh, by the extreme right uh, uh, in Italy, like the cultural scene of the extreme right, uh, uh, as a way to express themselves, uh, as a way to express uh, uh, their uh, frustration of being relegated in, uh, uh, in a ghetto, in a political ghetto. Uh, but there was also a phase uh, where music uh, was used uh, uh, to um, to express some uh, novelties, some some novel, some new ways uh, of making uh, uh, politics. Uh, uh, like there was the phase uh, uh, during the late 70s and the beginning of the uh, of the 80s, uh, uh, where music was uh, 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 understood uh, as a way of escaping uh, uh, the rigid structure imposed by the MSI. And nowadays, uh, uh, extreme right music uh, is a way of expressing for young people. Uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the, the leader of uh, Casa Pound is also the leader of a music band called uh, Zeta, Zeta Zero Alpha. And uh, on the other side, music is also a, a, a production of a, a cultural material, and there are uh, many. Uh, not only many bands, but also uh, many labels uh, uh, that uh, uh, produce these bands. Uh, and I would like to mention the fact that uh, on Spotify, I, I, I discovered it recently, you can have access to all, nearly all of these bands. Uh, so this is a bright, a very fast and bright circulation of this kind of, uh, of music, which also has uh, uh, violent uh, cont uh, contents. Uh, in Germany, uh, the situation was uh, not, not the same. Uh, the circulation of extreme right music started, uh, started in the uh, late 60s. Uh, it's st also started with a very big impact uh, of uh, uh, the skinhead culture. Uh, and uh, it has also become a, a very big, uh, 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 element of uh, fundraising, uh, of uh, 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 recruitment, uh, uh, of circulation of ideas. Uh, and what is interesting uh, is not only to listen to the music, to uh, understand what the texts are, uh, what the different music uh, genres uh, are used, but it's the very fact that uh, uh, this uh, uh, investment uh, in culture, in, from this point of view, in music, uh, creates huge festivals uh, at European uh, uh, level. And uh, these festivals, these extreme right music festivals, uh, are really a basis uh, for recruitment, uh, are really a basis uh, for the circulation of ideas. Uh, if we can talk about ideologies, uh, this is another another element which we can take into account uh, because uh, even if you make interviews uh, with these people the idea of the fascist or the nazi ideology is far away from uh, the knowledge of of this uh, uh, of these members of extreme right uh, uh, parties or movements like they do not have uh, the historic knowledge uh, of what fascist, uh, uh, fascism or what the Nazi regime was. Uh, but despite that, they call themselves fascists. They call themselves uh, 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 appreciators uh, of uh, uh, the Nazi regime. But uh, 
I mean, the, the research I made on music uh, is only a little step uh, towards the understanding the extreme right uh, and within the extreme right, uh, the um, legitimation, the use of violence, uh, latent uh, or used, uh, uh, is uh, one of the cultural elements. Uh, these, uh, uh, these elements uh, are manifold, it is not only music, it is clothing, the way people uh, uh, are, are, are dressed, uh, it is the way of, uh, uh, of using tattoos, uh, like uh, Cinzia miller Idris wrote a wonderful book uh, on uh, uh, the, the, the way that young people, young extreme right people represent themselves like aesthetically uh, in, uh, in Germany. And it is uh, easily recognizable that uh, culture, uh, the, the, the big notion of, uh, of culture, of culture belong, belonging, of cultural uh, understanding is one of the elements uh, uh, that nowadays uh, uh, instead of uh, historical knowledge uh, is uh, an element uh, uh, of belonging for uh, extreme right, young extreme right uh, members. It is a way of circulation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, extreme right ideas, uh, values, uh, ideologies, uh, where uh, uh, the use of violence uh, uh, is also one of the tools. Like if you look at the uh, what T-shirts uh, uh, have as claims on the T-shirt, uh, I mean, violence is there. It is uh, uh, it is there in every uh, uh, in every uh, in every T-shirt, uh, and uh, the circulation of these T-shirts uh, is uh, online. It is uh, uh, one of the elements that uh, is most profitable in terms of uh, uh, of fundraising and of uh, uh, circulation of ideas. Or, yeah, that's um, that, that that's very interesting. I, I, the, some of the work I'm doing myself at the moment, looking at this, um, at the we talked, we had a session on martyrs, and I was talking about the work that I'm doing on on a, a fascist martyr in 1921 of Giovanni Berta, and 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 song and music is very very much part. It's partly the reason that I asked. It is very much part of the squadrista um, identity. Uh, self-expression at the time and and also a, a, the use of violent language and a, a means of announcing their presence as well the way of actually saying you know and letting people know that they were arriving of be of being threatening so um and when you talk about clothing there as well it, it, it makes me think straight away about the many of the problems and i don't think we, should, well, we won't go down that road because we've got one point i'd like to raise a question um before we finish at 7 30 but it makes me think about the the, the very big problem um, of the souvenir shops in, in Predapio as well, and and the, the violence of those messages of the of those t-shirts of baseball bats with Menefrigo written on them that you can openly buy of the Mussolini calendars. These are all different latent expressions of violence. What we what we've talked about. I think that that's a really interesting point. Um, we have we have one um, point really, uh, perhaps which I could just perhaps if you'd like to to respond to, you can probably see it here anyway from um, Sandra Dugo, uh, who talks about um, saying in Italy um, that currently in Italy only the extreme right is carrying out, are carrying out serious attacks on people's health. Um, they're not communists, and she's she says she's specifically referring to the Novax and the Known Green Pass uh, movements that are attacking. Um, she says for free, uh, freedoms to live. Um, she doesn't know of any other violent attacks that come from Italian communists, neither in the past nor now. Can um, could I mean? If we've got if we have a couple of minutes each. Could you perhaps say anything about something we uh, have? I mean, I mean, I mean uh, but from the left. No, no, no. When I was saying that you know, if something is coming from communists, we <laughs> have to say that. I was very hypothetical, <laughs> so the, I was not saying that, you know, there has been attacks made by the left today, no. But I what I was simply saying is that, you know, we should be clear, honest, everyone on the right, left, center, if someone is coming from your political, ideological area, even if you're not very, very close, we, we shouldn't be ashamed to say that, nor we should be like this right-wing politicians in Italy, you know, blurring everything in, you know, violence is violence when coming from all sides. We cannot just say that is on the right because we should say at the same time 
that the left is doing this. No, they, if they are honest and hundred percent honest, they should say, Forza Nuova is a movement who is close to some of our ideas, maybe not to all. And they have, to, and they should, you know, implement and and you know seriously put policies showing that they are different. Otherwise, you know, is impossible. You cannot. Uh, you cannot uh, criticize a terrorist act without mentioning the ideas that eventually move those people. It's simply, my view is simply unfair because you should be able to say, well, this guy was against immigration and this guy made this, but I'm against immigration, but I'm fully uh, against this type of violence. No, they never use that. They talk about something, you know, no, well, a, a, a lone terrorist. This is unacceptable. They need to pay time in prison and so on. But I mean, let's say these people, as I said before, these people are coming, are reading from, uh, you know, specific ideological texts, websites, manifestos, and so on. Then they radicalize it. And likely not everyone is radicalizing up to a terrorist point. But still, we need to we need to be honest. And and what I'm and what I'm seeing is that there is too much direct or indirect legitimization of this type of violence. Yeah, and if I may add something about uh, uh, the what we are we are now witnessing uh, uh, the so let's say it's uh, infiltration of the extreme right in the. Uh, no vax uh, uh, movement uh, or no green pass movement. Uh, this is something we could uh, uh, we have to think about. Uh, I mean, uh, the no vax uh, uh, and no green pass movement is something which uh, signalizes uh, a big uh, uh, level of uh, uh, frustration uh, uh, of citizens. Uh, in my opinion. Uh, towards uh, uh, the uh, functioning of representative democracy. Uh, and the extreme right uh, has had the opportunity of, uh, from one side, uh, infiltrating these, uh, uh, these movements, uh, like because they have the organizational strength of doing that. We don't have to forget it. Uh, on the other side, like for example, in Germany, the extreme right has been one of the first uh, uh, movements that uh, uh, really interpreted uh, um, this way of this discontent uh, uh, of the people uh, towards uh, uh, representative democracy and, uh, of course, these uh, uh, exceptional times uh, of, uh, uh, of social restrictions uh, and of, uh, uh, of a big role that the governments have had uh, in the management uh, of the pandemic uh, have made all these feelings uh, explode. So, in my opinion, uh, also, the movement uh, uh, of uh, against uh, uh, the, uh, the vaccination uh, and against the use of the Green Pass must be understood uh, within the very big landscape uh, of uh, the crisis uh, uh, of uh, uh, representative democracy. Not if we understand it as the crisis of uh, democracies that led to the uh, to the uh, undemocratic regimes. Uh, uh, that we are talking about, uh, but a very big level of sufferance uh, uh, of uh, uh, citizens uh, who have a low level of political knowledge, uh, whose level of political knowledge, knowledge uh, uh, could not be different, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> given the very uh, the very poor landscape uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the media that we are uh, talking about. Uh, uh, so uh, instead of uh, uh, only uh, criticize, criticizing, I think we should be make the effort of understanding all of these manifestations uh, of frustrations uh, towards a representative democracy uh, and, uh, and see how uh, these, through these movements, uh, also the, 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 the possibilities uh, of, uh, in this case, uh, uh, far right and extreme right movements uh, uh, can only be facilitated. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that, Georgia. Um, time is, um, well, we're at, we're at 7.30 and we have to finish at 7.30. So um, I'll, I will leave it there. Um, thank you both very, very much. That was that that was fantastic. It was really great, um, and a great way to to round up this.
this series of uh, of nine uh, conversations that we had running from uh, from March onwards and again. So a big thanks to everybody who participated in that, and and a thank you to everybody who's tuned in. Um, and as I said at the beginning, they are all available on the uh, BSI YouTube site if anybody would like to go uh, back to those. So thanks once again to you both and um, want to say that. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. ciao.